Last Sunday was an amazing Sunday celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And without the fact of Jesus rising from the dead, there would be no Christianity, there would be no church, there wouldn't be any of this. But the resurrection is a game changer. That God would come in the flesh and abolish humanity's greatest enemy. With all of the human advancements and, and technological advancements and, and scientific medical breakthroughs of humanity, humanity has never and will never be able to conquer death. And though all the fancy creams and lotions and all the surgeries might get you to live maybe five years longer, we're still going to die. The inevitable is coming. But there was one, Jesus, who destroyed death and gives the hope of an endless, resurrected life with a new body that doesn't decay, with a new body that lasts forever, that feels no pain or sorrow. And that is a great hope that we have in Christ. Amen? But this is what I find happens to too many Christians, where we totally do appreciate and adore what Jesus is doing as we look at him there on the cross. And the cross is meant to expose us, convict us, cause worship as we see our king there suffering for us. We all should have those moments for the rest of our lives where we are cut to the core, that we are pierced in our hearts when we remember once again he was pierced in his hands and feet for us. We look at him and we adore him and we worship him. But I think too many Christians get in a habit of just kind of doing drive-bys to the cross. Love you. Thank you for what you did. When the cross is meant to be something so much deeper for us. The cross is meant to not only be adored, but we're to be immersed and brought into it, you see. That there is a sort of a, a baptism that should take place where... We are there with Christ on the cross. We are there being crucified. We are immersed into his death and we are immersed into his resurrection because from Jesus' perspective, when he's up there on the cross, he brought you up there with him. And he took you into the tomb with you and he left all of the obnoxious, sinful parts about you in the tomb. And when Jesus burst up out of that tomb, you know what? He was carrying you in himself. You were with him as he rose from the dead. And God wants us to dive deep into what this means for us. And so our text this morning from Romans chapter 6, we're going to read it together starting in verse 3. And I might have a little bit of commentary as as we read through. Verse 3, Romans chapter 6, Paul writes, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now first, no, Paul is not talking about water baptism. This has nothing to do with about being dunked into the water. He's talking about your spiritual baptism, which we would call salvation. You see, the word baptism in the Greek simply means immersion. That's what baptism means. The definition of the word means immersed. It's like when you go to the swimming pool and if you dip your little toes in, you're not being immersed. You're just getting, you know, you're just wetting just a part of your toes. Immersion is when you take the plunge and you you dive in head to toe. And when you go into the water and we can't see any part of you, you are now immersed, not just dipped a little bit, you are immersed into the water. Paul is saying, When we got saved, we were immersed into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it should affect our lives. Look at verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should, everyone say we should, we should walk in. In newness of life. And newness of life is a very good word for us as Christians. New life. Freshness of life. New seasons of life. New outpourings of the Spirit. Just a new life. That's that's what we all crave. That's what we want from God. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness 
of his resurrection. Notice it doesn't say that we were literally there 2,000 years ago on the cross. It doesn't say that. It says that our lives should portray a likeness to what happened to Jesus on the cross. Verse 7, 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11. Likewise, you also. This is a command. You. Paul is saying, you Christians, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word reckon is an interesting word. It reminds me of my cowboy grandpa. I would ask him a question, and I I learned that my grandpa didn't say the word yes very much. His yes was to kind of look at me and say, I reckon. (laughs) He's a cowboy, and that's just how cowboys talk, I guess. And so I, I heard that. I reckon. Why can't you just say yes? I don't know. I reckon. And so a reckoning means you're talking to yourself. You reckon something to be true. So as I'm talking through this stuff today, you got to be good at preaching to yourself. I'm not your preacher today. You're your own preacher today. You're just going to listen to what I'm saying, and you're going to talk to yourself. You're going to have to do some examining. You're going to have to talk to your conscience today. Speaking to yourself. Letting this be real to your life, okay? So here it is. Paul, in this passage of scripture, is not talking about our life in heaven. He's talking about this life we have left on earth. And in this passage of scripture, we find a concept presented. And the concept is called death, burial, and resurrection. We learn from this passage that death, burial, and resurrection is not only a literal event that Jesus experienced. It's not just a literal experience that will happen to us one day as we receive our resurrected bodies after we die. But in this passage, we find that death, burial, and resurrection is a spiritual principle. Everyone say spiritual principle. And it is meant to greatly affect our lives. You see, God is a God of principles. He operates through principles. Now, there are exceptions to this. And those exceptions are usually called miracles. Where God works outside of the physics uh, 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 and, you know, just principles of physics and principles of math and everything like that. Those are miracles. But for the most part. God works in principles. And if you don't know the Bible's principles, you're going to be very confused with God. In fact, raise your hand if you've ever been confused with God. Come on, I mean, I have. Raise your hand if, be honest, if you've ever felt disappointed with God. Just, why would you do this, God? Frustrated with God. You ever been frustrated? You are not doing this the way I would do it if I were God. And he's like, well, that's the whole point. You're not. And my ways are higher in your ways and deeper than your ways. And I cause you to wait on things way, way more than what you want to wait on them for. But nevertheless, God has principles. He's not just saying, oh, I'll decide to do this or, oh, I'll decide to do this. He's laid out principles for us to know and it helps us to understand God better. Maybe you've come to a point in your Christian life and you're, you're like, God, I just don't know you the way I thought I did because you're revealing more things. You're allowing things that are, man, these are hard things. And you know he's there, but you're like, man, I'm learning you in a whole new way. I hope that's what happens to you guys today. Principles. The reason why two plus two will always equal four is because God is a God of principle and God created math. And math is one of the sovereign principles that he's using to govern the universe. 
Gravity is a principle that always works on earth. Don't try to test it. Trust me. It's a principle. Entropy is a principle. There are other principles of, uh, you know, the centrifugal force. There's just all these principles in physics and science and everything like that. But I also want you to know God has given us these things to teach us. He works in these principles in the spiritual realm. We see the universe full of principle because there's a spiritual dimension of reality that he's wanting us to tap into to know, okay, these are your principles. And I promise you, the more you learn God's principles, the easier it will help you to handle life. When you're confused and disappointed and frustrated with God, you're able to say, oh, there's a principle at work. And now I I have a little bit more of an understanding to you, God. And that gives us peace in our lives. Let me give you just one example of a spiritual principle. One spiritual principle Jesus mentioned is this. And this works just as easily as one plus one will equal two. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, If you seek first the kingdom of heaven, which means you prioritize heaven, you prioritize a relationship with God, and you make that first and foremost. You're going to read the word. You're going to have devotions with Jesus. You seek first the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what he says? All these other things, your practical daily cares and worries, it'll all be taken care of for you. That is a spiritual principle. You seek first the kingdom of God, and all of a sudden you will just see things work out, doors open, doors close, provision of God, you'll see it just like that. Now, no presidential candidate has ever gotten up and said, if you put me first in your life, I will take care of everything else daily for you. I mean, so I want Jesus as my king. I'd vote for that guy in a heartbeat. If that's the package he's got for me, I want his government. Well, it's coming soon. His kingdom's coming soon, amen? That's just one spiritual principle. And there are many that he works by, but may I suggest to you, there is one overall, one main principle above all others by which God works. There is a main principle. Because since the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest event in human history, and really it's God's most important accomplishment, then the principle of death, burial, and resurrection has a very, very important place in your life as a believer. So as I teach this morning, I want you to grow closer to God. I want you to understand this is the main way God has been working and will continue to be working in your life. You're going through a process of death, burial, and resurrection. Some of you will be much less confused with God after today. I want you to just really try to process these things that I'm going to talk about because you really got to pay attention. You really got to tune in. You really got to process your life to these things that I'm going to be sharing. And as you do, some of you, you're going to recognize. You're going to be able to look at 10 years ago in your life and say, oh my gosh, God, you work this principle. You're going to be able to identify yourself. I'm in this season because if you are born again and if the Spirit of God is in your life, I guarantee you, you are in one of these three stages as God works out the principle for you. You are either going through a death a burial, or you're seeing God's power and you're seeing something resurrection-like in your life. Every Christian should understand this principle of death, burial, resurrection because it will make life more understandable. So maybe we can have a little bit of fun with this. Death, burial, resurrection. We got three groups, so how about when I point to you guys, you're going to say death. When I point to you, you're going to say burial. When I point to you guys, you're going to say resurrection. Okay, let's do it. That was weak, but. Come on, first group, let's bring it. Yeah. No, you got the good one. I don't know if we'll do that again, but. Here we go. The principle of death, burial, resurrection, guys, it's all around us. God has woven it into the very fabric of his creation. We know this because of something Jesus said, something very profound. 
We'll show it to you on the screen. John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. He said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, unless a little grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And the disciples look at each other and say, Huh? What's homie talking about wheat for? (laughs) A piece of wheat? Jesus said this right before his crucifixion. He talks about his own death, burial, and resurrection by using the example of a kernel of wheat. You see, unless that kernel of wheat has a death and separates, and unless it's buried into the ground, it remains alone. But if it gets buried, it's going to produce a whole new crop, a whole new harvest. And as Jesus went to the ground and was buried as one body... Look at all of us. He went into the ground to produce a whole harvest. And there's a lot more than us that's going to be in heaven. And so he says, man, in the creation, God put it in the wheat, death, burial, and resurrection. And so because Jesus likens his own death, burial, and resurrection to wheat, it lets us know, wow, God, you really have woven this principle into everyday life. In fact, we see God instituting the theme of death, burial, and resurrection long before Jesus was on the cross. He does it way back in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation. On the third day of creation in Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, On the earth, and it was so. Do you guys understand that God only created fruit trees one time? He only created fruit trees once. And the fruit trees we have today are not the same fruit trees God created thousands of years ago. So how do we still have fruit trees if he only created them once? Well, God made the trees in such a way that they could reproduce themselves. And for in order order for an apple tree... To make new apple trees, it has to go through its own process of death, burial, and resurrection. You see, you and I, when we think about the word death, we need to adopt God's definition of death because we have typically a a wrong view of death. To God, death never means the cessation of life. The word death to God only means a separation. Nothing completely dies forever. Even a non-believer is going to live forever. So if I were to all of a sudden drop dead today and fall down and die, you would say, oh, he's dead, he's gone. But that's not the truth. The truth is that my spirit would just separate from this temporal carcass. Death to God means separation. So from now on today, when I say the word death, you got to know it's the word separation. That's what it means. And separating feels like death sometimes. It's a hard thing, separations of life. And so we, we get all upset because we got this one little apple we're trying to hold on to. And we're like, oh my gosh, don't take my apple, Lord. It would be the worst thing in the world for you to take my apple. And God's like, let the thing separate and die. Think about it, that apple has to go through a rotting process, a death process. Something kind of ugly happens. But eventually, if that seed's buried into the ground, you lose an apple. And God's like, stop crying about your apple because you're losing an apple in order to eventually get a whole new tree full of apples. Do you understand? We need to stop whining about the little apples God takes away from us. Because he's just wanting to take us through the process of a death and a burial and a resurrection. And if we go through the process, that whole new tree full of apples, man, that looks a lot better than the one little tiny apple we're trying to hold on to. Thinking it's going to be the worst thing in the world if God takes this away from me. God not only put the principles of death, burial, and resurrection into the creation. He also put it into everyday human existence. And again, he did it early on in Genesis when he created a man and a woman's reproductive system. You see, a seed separates from a man's body. It belonged to the man. It separates from the man. That seed gets buried into a woman's womb. 
And as it's buried in the womb unseen, a miracle takes place and out comes a miraculous new life. Do you understand? That is a separation and a burial and a resurrection. And God has woven it into everyday existence to point us to Jesus, to point us to the resurrection, to point us to the reality of how God works. So what I want to do today is explore how this principle applies to your everyday living. Because, yes, we have salvation alone from Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And he's the hero of every story, and it's all about him. And we have, we have no salvation, no matter what process God takes us through, without Jesus. Amen? But listen, you become sanctified, and you become more like Jesus as God takes you through your own processes of death, burial, and resurrection. You see, this is to be a cyclical thing that happens over and over and over and over and over, 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 and over in your life. You're always going through this process. And, and we shouldn't be surprised by this because Jesus revealed that every disciple will have to go through this process. He mentioned this. Well, first, Paul... You know, let me talk about Paul. Paul in Galatians 2.20, check this out. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's no drive-by appreciations of the cross in this statement. This is Paul getting closer to the cross in his prayer life. Seeking the cross, seeking the meaning of the cross, having chunks of time in the presence of God to the point where Paul said, you know what? I want to jump up there with you. I want to be a crucified man. I'm crucified with Christ, which means I'm going to be a buried man and I'm going to, I'm going to be a resurrected man. And I'm going to embrace this process in my life. Now, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Everyone say daily. And follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, if you try to hold on, you're going to lose a lot. But if you lose your life and your dreams for the sake of God, you're going to gain something infinitely more exciting and better for your life. Lose your life to gain a life that Christ wants to give and unfold to you. We're told daily we're to die. What does that mean? It means daily we surrender our selfishness and our self-absorbed nature. To say, I I want to be selfless. I want to be a servant. You lay your own dreams to him and say, if you want to change it, go ahead. Because I am not the master of my own destiny. I don't want to be anymore. May your will be done. May I die to myself to be about your mission and to be about your purposes. Because that's way more exciting than my little old boring life on my own. You know, we're not really living and experiencing resurrected living until we are given over to his purposes, sold out for him and what he wants to do with us. And so Jesus said, if you want to come after me, follow my path. And that is a path of the cross. No one wants to suffer, but everyone wants the resurrection. But there's no resurrection without going through the process. So let me, to just give you some handles to maybe help your, you out, if you're taking notes, I want to give you three ways, three ways in which our lives experience the process of death, burial, and resurrection. And as I go through, hopefully you'll be able to identify where you're at or maybe some areas in your life. And you can say, yeah, this area of my life is, is under this principle right now. So everyone say number one. Suffering is how we're conformed to Christ's death. And there's no other way around this. In Philippians chapter 3 verses 10 and 11, Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the intimacy. And I only have intimacy in this way through suffering. 
I'll only get closer to Christ in this way through suffering. To be conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And my friends, there are so many reasons to why suffering benefits us. I could give a whole hour teaching and I could give you 15 or 20 different reasons of the benefits of temporarily suffering. Because there are many. But the simple bottom line point is this. Many of you would never have gotten saved without pain allowed in your life. Many of you would have never fallen in love with Jesus the way you have without that pain being allowed in your life. Many of you would not be here today without him letting you have a broken heart and come to some place of desperation in your life. Can you agree with that? Can, I, can you raise your hand if, if you could testify to that? When we fell in the Garden of Eden, when humanity brought sin into this world, immediately God pronounced a curse of thorns and thistles into this world. But it was not meant to be against us. It was meant to be for us. Because God wants you to feel the thorns and thistles of this life because it's meant to drive you to desperation for Jesus. It's meant to drive you to a place where you know you can't do it on your own. You know you can't just man up and get her done because it's too overwhelming for that. You need a Savior You need a hero. It's not yourself. His name is Jesus Christ. And he always comes through for the broken, desperate heart who seeks him and rests on his deliverance. Amen? Amen. So if you're looking for God to make this world heaven, he's not about that life. Heaven is heaven. God allows the curse of the thorns and thistles to poke at you, to get at you. You will always have a sense of restlessness. No matter if you attain all your goals, you'll never have a full sense of achievement or accomplishment because that will be fully experienced by you when you get to heaven. Because heaven is heaven and fallen earth is fallen earth. And God wants to make sure to remind you This isn't heaven. The thorns and thistles of life are meant to benefit you. And so suffering, it's many benefits. You just need to remember, he promises all things work for your good. It don't feel good. He didn't say all things are going to feel good. He didn't say that all things will be good in about three months. I won't let you suffer past the three-month line. I wish he would have, but the Bible doesn't say that. But eventually, all things, we will realize and we will thank him. All that pain worked out for good in the end. Everyone say number two. Separation is how we're conformed to Christ's burial. And there are a lot of things that God has separated you from. There are things he's trying to separate you from today. And there will continue to be things he tries to separate you from in the future. So there's a lot of things that could involve separation. But the biggest thing and the most obvious thing God wants to separate us all from is sin. That's the big thing. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 24, listen to how Paul writes this. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. He doesn't just say those who are Christ's sin less. No, he puts the principle in play. If you're Christ, you're learning to be crucified with him. You're crucifying your sins to the cross. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to stop doing this sin that has hounded me my whole life. I'm just going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop whatever. I'm going to stop looking at porn. I'm going to stop. You can't just do that. You don't got the power. The power is found as you jump up on the cross and follow Jesus to it. And you immerse yourself and you let the Spirit of God baptize you into the cross and into the death and into the resurrection. You're crucified with Christ. And it's like there's there's something in that because when your hands are crucified, they can't move. Your hands that ran into sin, that used to roll all those nice little joints and whatever you did with those hands that was sinful... When you will let them be crucified, they can't do that junk no more. The places your feet used to walk to, when you're truly crucified, they can't move anymore. And the old nature is sanctified and it's being crucified into the cross. Not for salvation, that's already happened. But we're just talking about the rest of your life on earth now and what it's going to look like. 
God might wanting, he, he might want to separate you from a group of people. A group of people. Everyone say, mm-hmm. You know, you, you get back with that old group of people and all of a sudden there's a little sliver inside of you that is tempted to go back into that old life. Oh, you start talking about the good old days when you, you, you used to party it up and, oh yeah, I could drink more beer. You start bragging and everything. And it's like, don't forget, that is what you begged God with tears to save you out of. That is not the better life. You go back into it, you'll realize in a quick hurry, it did only take about a month for you to realize, oh yeah, I begged you to take me out of this life, Lord. It could be a person. The devil wants to hook you up with this person and God don't. And sometimes a separation from maybe a dysfunctional person you've tried to help over and over and over. And finally God says, there's a line. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you and, and tell you to let go. Maybe it's a culture, a dysfunctional culture. Maybe it's a job. And you're like, oh, I don't want to lose that job. And, and God's like, I want to separate you from this. It could be a hobby that causes you to just waste your time. And when you're separated, you feel buried. You feel like a big old stone's rolled in front of you. And you, it's when it hurts the most. When your heart hurts the most is when God is burying you. But the burying always leads to the next step. Everyone say point three. Anytime the power of God is really at work in your life, that conforms us to the likeness of the resurrection. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11, Paul says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same Spirit that rose a dead body up has been planted in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. It's when you experience freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. It's it's been separated from you and it's buried. And now there's, there's just a breakthrough and it's awesome and it feels so good in your life. Maybe it's a renewed prayer life. All of a sudden you're a prayer maniac and it's something resurrection-like that's bursting inside of you. When you start to get passionate about the Bible or you actually, it's like, I want to be at church. That's weird. Because most people don't want to be and I want to be. Man, there's something that's resurrection-like that's taking place inside of you. When your prayers are answered and it's like, oh my gosh, God, you came through for me. When a miracle takes place in your life. Or maybe it's just a fresh, brand new, exciting season in life because it's been crummy. Because you've already been going through the process. You see, if you feel buried right now and you look across the room and you see a brother or a sister and they're just like on top of the world and they're being blessed by God. God. And it's like, man, every time they pray, God answers their prayer. Well, don't you worry and don't get down on them. You jo- be joyful with them because you don't understand what they've just gone through the last couple years. Do you understand? In order for them to get where they are, they, they've went through their separation process. They've went through their burial process. So let them enjoy where God has them. And you look at your own life. And know, okay, I'm in a process. I'm in a season. And I'm going to walk by faith in this season. Because yours is coming. For Jesus, it was only three days later. It might be a little longer. But you just keep waiting. And you will see the power of God. It's when you can look at something and say, only God did it. I mean, I was so confused. I was so hurt. It's when you start repenting because you're like, God, I'm sorry I said those things to you. I should have trusted in you. Oh, me of little faith, you know. And you're like, you're working. And it's, oh my gosh. You realize God's taken you through a process of death, burial, and resurrection. And enjoy the good because he'll bring you back around. There'll be another separation and another burial. And, another, you know, it's a, it's a cycle. And I hope the wheels are turning. I hope you can identify. I hope you can look at 20 years ago and you can see what God was up to. I hope you can look at your life now and say, you know what? I think I'm in this step of the process right now. The good news is there's always a third step to the process for those who have a heart of faith. For those who, like Jesus, say, I commit my spirit into your hands, Father. You do with me what you want. There is always that third step 
of deliverance, of your hero showing up to save you once again and to provide for you once again. And you know what? If you look at all the stories of the Bible, if you look at the main characters of men and women from the Bible, and if you look at their life, you'll see, oh my gosh, their whole life was one big cycle of a death and a burial and a resurrection. Think of Abraham. Abraham, separated from his homeland, died to everything he grew up with, buried in a foreign land. And then one day God said, hey, come outside. I want to show you all the stars. This is the amount of your descendants, Abraham. I'm working all things for good in your life. Or what about Joseph? Oh, my goodness. Separated from his family, treated so harshly, his father Jacob thought he was literally dead. He was buried in a foreign land called Egypt. He was buried in a jail cell for something he never even did. But while he was rotting away in that jail cell, things were happening to conform him to be more like Jesus. And when the time was right, it only took one day for God to reverse his fortunes. And in one day, he's raised up to be the prime minister of Egypt and be the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That is a separation, a burial, and a resurrection that points us to Jesus Christ. What about Job? A lot was taken from Job. He suffered a lot of pain. A lot was separated from this man. He felt buried. He felt abandoned by God. And then God raised him out and blessed him way more in the second half of his life than he was in the first half of his life. He was more better off than he was in the end than he was before it started. And what about Moses? Separated from all of Egypt's wealth. Separated from his identity as a prince. Buried in the desert for 40 years. And then all of a sudden, one day, a burning bush starts speaking to him. And God raises him up, sends him back to be a new man and to be the deliverer of Israel. That's a death, burial, and resurrection of this man's life. What about Jonah? Separated from mankind in the boat, buried In the ocean, in a fish's belly, the process makes him come back an obedient man. David, separated from society, running scared for his life from King Saul. He felt buried and abandoned in the desert. And yet, God was just preparing him. And God raised him up to be the great king of Israel. The sweet psalmist of Israel. So God had a plan at all. What about Elijah? His fear caused him to be separated from the ministry and from the land of Israel. He was buried in self-pity and doubt. And and God brought him back. And his ministry was so powerful when he came back. Renewed with passion. The Apostle Paul, separated from his entire old life of Judaism as a Pharisee. Buried in the city of Tarsus for 10 years thinking, God... Did you really not speak to me that I was going to go around the world? I'm here for 10 years rotting away. And then one day out of nowhere, as he kept his faith, he sees his old buddy Barnabas walking through town. And Barnabas says, hey, dude, it's time to go. And he ends up becoming the greatest missionary of all time, probably the most successful Christian of all time. Wrote half the New Testament. What about John, the apostle? separated from his friends, his family, his church, buried on this desolate island called Patmos. But it was there, while he was suffering, the greatest vision of all was given to him, and he pinned it. It's called the book of Revelation. And as I look at some of your lives, I can recognize, I see the power of God. I see the principles of God at work in you. In fact, there's someone in this room, they lost their job. You didn't lose anything. You were just being separated. See, the principle helps you to think right. Helps you to preach to yourself. You didn't lose anything. You're just separated. And the separation hurts a little bit. Separated from the former identity the man had in his job. Buried and forgotten about. Enemies tried to bury this person. Tried to roll a big old stone over him just to ruin his life. And as no jobs open, they watch the bank account dwindle. It seems hopeless. 
But it's not hopeless when you have a God of resurrection. It's not hopeless when you know that there's a third day coming for you. It's not hopeless when you know that He's the God who removes stones and rolls away stones and brings you up out of it. He's a God who saves. He's a God who delivers. And as that person keeps waiting, feeling buried, God will show up one day. You know that, right? God won't abandon his kids in the tomb just as he did not abandon Jesus in the tomb. And a new job's coming. A, new li- a whole new season's coming. I've seen it happen over and over and over again for men. There's men in this room and that happened several years ago. And you're enjoying like, oh my gosh, I went through the process. And uh, I-, I-, I wept and cried and was so angry over losing that job. And man, I wouldn't trade the job I have now in the world. It just didn't happen like snippety snap like we wanted. There was a process of suffering. There was a process of being buried. Every Christian's always going through this process. Some of you have been separated from something recently. I hope this helps you to know how to think about it. Some of you feel buried and you don't know what to do. Do you know what you do when you don't know what to do? Don't do anything because you'll just make a mess of it. Take Moses' wise, wise teaching. They were cornered. On one side was a mountain too big for them to climb. On the other side was an ocean they couldn't cross without boats. And the only way out, Pharaoh and his army were hot on their trail, ready to come to murder them. There was nothing they can do. And when you find yourself in a situation where you're like, I've tried everything and there's nothing I can do. This is what Moses would say to you as he spoke to all the people about to freak out on him. He said, number one, don't be afraid. Number two, stand still. Number three, watch the salvation of God. Watch the salvation of God because it's not determined on you to do it because God doesn't want you to be the hero of the story. He wants to be the hero of the story. And if you're trying to figure it out being the hero of the story, he he might just let you be buried a little longer. So the greatest thing you can do is just be desperate and hopeful and faithful because he's going to get you out of it. And just as he did for Moses, he'll provide a way when there is no way. He'll provide a way that's his way and not your way. Amen? That's what he wants to do. So to close, back to, back to our text. I just want to read Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in in newness of life. You've been buried. Let's try this again. Buried into his. You've been buried into his. And you've been buried into. And you've been immersed. Baptized into his. Yes. When, when, when you're baptized into his death. That's when you're consciously. You're, I'm going to take up this cross. And I'm not going to escape it. I'm not going to numb myself to it. I'm going to carry this burden because I know Jesus is going to yoke himself up to me and he's going to carry me through it. Many times we pray, take me away from the situation. And God says, no, I'm not going to take you away from it. I'm going to be with you and walk you through it. That's taking up your cross. It's when when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, this is my will, Father, but not my will, your will be done. You're being separated from your own will. And when you have your own moments where it's like, God, I really want you to do this. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swallow this pill down and say, may your will be done. You're voluntarily dying and immersing yourself to the cross when you say, not my will be done. When you're able to say, I feel like I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm a crucified man. You're becoming a dead man. Exactly what Jesus wants. When you're immersed into his burial is is when Paul made statements like, you know what? 
a long time ago, the world died to me and I died to the world. The world just doesn't want much to do with me anymore. You're buried. When the world wants to roll a stone over you and just pass you off and pretend like you don't exist and just treat you awfully. When your heart hurts the most. When you separate from something and it hurts, you're buried. And it's when you're the most desperate for God's power. You're the most desperate for God's power and that's like you being in a tomb of death you can't get out of and you need God's power to roam that stone away. And that's what happens. When you're walking in the likeness of resurrection is when you're experiencing his deliverances. When you look back and say, oh my gosh, only God did it. And you go to all your friends, God did it. You know what? God did it. God did it because you're so pumped because you really know, oh my gosh, God did this. His power's working. You're experiencing fresh, new spiritual life. Death, burial, and resurrection.